the good news is that healing is possible. That our Good Friday, Holy Saturday world can in fact arrive at Easter. The Easter story is a story about the worst things we do to one another. About how greed, power, and systems of oppression can and do conspire to kill anything that threatens their grip on society. It's a story about a young man who befriends and cares for the outcasts of society being chosen by the state for death precisely because of his care. I don't think I have to tell you that this ancient story is a story about our world too. That we who have lost over 500,000 of our fellow citizens and nearly 3 million of our human family we who have watched as the tent cities under bridges and in parks have grown and grown while the ultra wealthy have become only more so. We who are learning that the reopening of society comes with a resurgence of mass shootings. I don't think that I have to tell you that we live in a Holy Saturday journey through hell kind of place. I don't have to tell you that our world where voting rights remain under attack and the trials of cops who murder our siblings, especially our black siblings, are always in name and function trials of the victims themselves. And I have to tell you that we live in a Good Friday world. But of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. It would be a failure of my duty to this story and my call to tell you the truth, to preach about Easter without naming the violence of our systems. I can't do this honestly without mentioning that in recent weeks, LAPD has killed at least eight people and that over a hundred people, including journalists and legal observers, were beaten and arrested last week when they attempted to witness and hold vigil as a large community of our homeless neighbors were swept from their safe encampment near Echo Park Lake. Before the good news of Easter, I have to be serious with you about the status of our own journey through hell. Let's take a moment to breathe with that. The good news is that something else is possible. Marty mentioned earlier the story of Doubting Thomas, of St. Thomas who could not believe that it was Jesus back from the tomb without putting his fingers in the wounds. I think about this a lot and in a lot of different ways about how we require people to prove their pain before we will take it seriously. And also about how we as Unitarian Universalists want to experience something, want to have a direct experience of pretty much anything before we're willing to believe in it. One of the gifts of being a Unitarian Universalist on Easter is that I can look at Easter from pretty much any direction I want. We can think about this story pretty much from whatever angle we want. And though it is compelling to me to go through all of the ways in which we are currently 
in Holy Saturday journeying through hell. I want to think about it a little differently this year. I want to think about the arc of Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday as an arc of trauma, dissociation, and healing. This is a really normal pattern that people who are traumatized and for the record, pretty much all people are traumatized go through. The problem of course is that we're not given a lot of resources to arrive at Easter Sunday. We're not given a lot of resources to arrive at the healing that comes after. We live in a traumatic society. We know that. We know that every day that we look at the news, or if you're like me, even don't look at the news and still absorb the messages of the world. Every day we experience the trauma of living in a profoundly unfair society. And though that trauma looks different for each of us depending on our location, it is still trauma. A common response to trauma is dissociation. Dissociation psychologically is thought of as separation from yourself. It's that kind of weird feeling where you can't figure out what you want to do, where your own motives and drives feel kind of lost to you. For some people, it's a sense of being kind of over here instead of in here. For a lot of Unitarian Universalists, I think the way we have come to approach the trauma of the world is by pushing ourselves up into our heads, by being as much as we can just thinking beings, by disconnecting from the messy viscera of all this down here and speaking from where we understand. The problem with that is that so much of what is traumatic surpasses understanding. And worse, you can understand it. You can understand the mechanisms of racism, the mechanisms of homophobia, the mechanisms of this severely in equitable society and still not feel any better about it. I am mad all the time that I cannot think my way past my emotions, that I can't identify what is happening and then say, all right, great, now I understand it, so it's over. Understanding isn't always enough and the answer to our doubts about what is possible comes in pushing ourselves back down into our bodies, coming home. We got a pretty good example of this process in pop culture recently musical artist who uh, you might know best for a kind of funny song about cowboys, Lil Nas X, released a song called Montero, Call Me By Your Name with an accompanying video. The song is just a fun poppy love song, um, really not a lot of deep content there. But the video is something much more interesting and we don't have the time here to get into all the specific symbolism of the video and i'll be honest it's not going to be to some of your taste but i'll tell you a little bit about it and then i'll get to what my point is here in the video lil nas x appears as each character and he begins saying in life, we hide the parts of ourselves that we don't want the world to see. We lock them away. 
we tell them no. We banish them, but here we don't. Welcome to Montero. Montero is Lil Nas X's first name, his given name. And in the course of the video, he is both Adam and Eve and the snake in the garden. He descends into hell and then he seduces and kills the devil and takes his throne. It is a lot. <laughs> and everybody in my world who does theology or studies classics has been digging in this brand new text for all of the various messages. For me though, the thing that has been most enlivening and important in it is a letter that Lil Nas X published written to his 14 year old self. He writes, dear 14 year old Montero, I wrote a song with our name in it. It's about a guy I met last summer. I know we promised to never come out publicly. I know we promised to never be that type of gay person. I know we promised to die with the secret, but this will open doors for many other queer people to simply exist. You see, this is very scary for me. People will be angry. They will say I am pushing an agenda, but the truth is I am. The agenda to make people stay the fuck out of other people's lives and stop dictating who they should be. Sending you love from the future. I think this sort of letter to our former selves, something that we have even practiced as a congregation, is such an important and life-giving part of getting to come home. Lil Nas X Montero grew up in a context where Christianity, as he was given, told him over and over and over again that his body and the things that his body and mind wanted were not only wrong, not only not a good idea, but an abomination. A theology that had him praying constantly to not be himself. How do you not dissociate when you're experiencing that kind of trauma? In her groundbreaking book, The Queer God, Marcella Althaus Reed writes, there are those who go to gay bars and salsa clubs with rosaries in their pockets and who make camp chapels of their living rooms. Others enter churches with love letters hidden in their bags because their need for God and their need for love refuse to fit into different compartments. Refuse to fit into different compartments. One of the pieces of symbolism found in the Call Me By Your Name video is some text from Plato's Symposium, which is written on the tree in the Garden of Eden scene. It is a bit of text about how humans have been pulled apart from themselves, something Plato believed that the gods did to make it so that we would love one another. In our modern society, I wonder if it's not that we've been ripped apart from ourselves that we need time, we need space to fall in love with ourselves as we are, to see that we are truly inherently worthy and given dignity by virtue of being, that we matter fundamentally. The way out of hell, the way of healing, the experience that answers our doubt about the possibility of healing our own wounds is coming home. 
is pushing back down into our bodies. It's remembering that this and this aren't separate. That we are not brains inside bodies or bodies being piloted by brains, but actually a highly interconnected system where all of this is as much me as this or these. So how do we come home? Not all of us are going to make wildly popular music videos that deeply upset uh, basically every religious conservative on the planet. It's not everybody's call, it's not everybody's game. So how do you get back inside of you? How do we respond to this world which will not stop giving us new traumas in a way that not only lets us breathe, but lets us give some piece of freedom to one another? For me, a lot of coming home is about remembering to have sensory experiences. This can be super hard when so much of our interaction with one another happens in a context where I can't get to you. Where some of us haven't seen or touched another person in a year. That makes getting back down into your body hard, but it is possible. I was trying to figure out how to write this sermon yesterday. I was trying to figure out what my point was. And as I often do when things are turning in my brain, I looked at Caitlin and I said, I think I need to go for a drive. And so for a drive, we went. We were listening to music, definitely including Call Me By Your Name. We got to a Vince Staples song that I hadn't listened to in a while. It doesn't really matter what song it is. What matters is that as it ends, there is a, a chorus that one can sing aloud with loudly, one can yell along with, and feel some relief of one's feelings about, say, a police department that has killed eight people in the last week. We got to the end of it and I said to Caitlin, is that good? Are you good? And we decided that we weren't, so we re rewound the song and yelled along with the outro again. For me, getting to be with music and with my partner in a way that is so visceral as yelling lets me come home a little bit. Sensory experiences, getting really into music, getting really into being in your body are really important for coming home into your body. Maybe you like to take walks or go for a run. Maybe you like to dig in a garden and feel the dirt in your hands. Maybe you are like Leonard Cohen who wrote Hallelujah about the holiness of specifically gay sex. Maybe you need some time alone. Maybe you need some time alone with your partner. Maybe you need a really good hug and you're like just waiting for your vaccine to be totally in effect to go get that hug. Maybe you need to eat your favorite food and not think about nutritional value or how many calories this has. Maybe you need to play a game with your children. Maybe you need to take a really long bath. Maybe you need a nap. Whatever it is that works for you to come home. Come home all the way 
forgive the things about you that you think make you unworthy. To know that it is not possible for you to be unworthy of love and care. And to then project that truth back into the world. To move in solidarity. To not give charity, but to be with people because you know that their freedom and your freedom are the same freedom. Because you know that you are worthy, and they are worthy, and I am worthy, and Lil Nas X is worthy, and we all are worthy and valuable and holy and precious and blessed. We might live in a holy Saturday world, might be on our own journeys through hell. But Easter is possible. Spring happens. And we are always, always in this together.